the next session of WPIC's presentation series at uh, the Shanghai Platinum Week in 2022. Up next, we have Trevor Raymond, who is Director of Research at the World Platinum Investment Council. Um, he leads our research and investor development. He joined from Anglo-American Platinum, where he was Head of Market Intelligence and Market Relations. A precious metal specialist with over 30 years experience in equity and, and metals markets, Trevor moved from the platinum industry in 2000, moved into the platinum industry in 2000, following 17 years in gold mining. And with that, welcome, Trevor. Right. Um, so thank you. What I'd, I'd like to do today is just for those of you that don't know the World Platinum Investment Council, even though we are a co-sponsor uh, of this event, for those of you who don't know us, I'll give a brief introduction of our business. I'll then try and set the scene in terms of the current state of the platinum and platinum group metals market. Uh, I'll then provide our updates of the uh, platinum quarterly that we published yesterday. That includes the uh, supply demand balance for the second quarter of 2022, as well as an update for the full year. And then I'll try and scratch below the data to try and give some more insights as to what we think is driving some of the recent trends and developments uh, in the platinum market. So uh, just looking at our team, uh, you heard from Paul Wilson, our CEO, earlier. Um, I'm responsible for research. Many of you know Wayben Deng, who's in charge of our Asia-Pacific uh, uh, efforts. And David Badham is our Chief uh, Administrative Officer. We have an office in Piccadilly in London, and we also have an office in Pudong uh, in Shanghai. Um, we were set up in 2014 to develop the global platinum investment market, and we do that in two ways. Uh, firstly, we try to assist investors in making more informed investment decisions. And to do that, we publish data analysis and provide insights to allow uh, investors to consider platinum as an investment asset class and make informed investment decisions. On the right-hand side, the other part of our business uh, is that we work with partners to make sure that when an investor wants to own platinum, they certainly are able to in the method of their choice, be that a borrow or a coin, an exchange-traded fund, uh, a future, uh, or indeed a platinum accumulation plan for people saving for their retirement. Um, the bottom box, we have quite a wide spread of investors, uh, from the man in the street, potentially owning a bar or coin or ETF, through wealth, uh, institutional, large institutional, all the way up to central banks. There's some examples. Uh, we were set up in 2014 by six South African platinum uh, group metal mining companies, we funded by the six on the left, Anglo-American Platinum, Impala Platinum, Northern Platinum, Royal Baffer King Platinum, Cedabello and Teresa. And you've heard from two uh, of those companies this morning, both Anglo-American uh, and Teresa. And then on the right, there are some selected product partners. Uh, the Royal Mint in the UK, 1100 years old, had never uh, produced a platinum bullion coin. We've worked with them and they've sold over 50,000 mainly into North American markets. And then you can see the Bank of China and some of our partners in China. We are not regulated. We do not issue our own products, uh, but our partners are a way to get the insight into the platinum market to a wider audience. That's a sample of our research, our quarterly, which we'll go through today. We have a one page focused on a particular topic. We have some longer reports uh, explaining this uh, investment asset class, and that includes palladium, very important link to platinum, and we put out three or four um, uh, 60 seconds in platinum uh, to the retail market uh, every month. That map shows that we've established a large global network of partners uh, dominated in North America and Asia. Uh, and we certainly work with those to make sure that uh, more products are available uh, to investors uh, globally. Some of the initiative examples, uh, we've heard about the Lingang project, a very important development uh, in Shanghai, certainly, uh, and we've been working closely to try and move that along. Similarly, uh, Shanghai Platinum Week, uh, we were very proud after several years of effort to be able to launch the inaugural uh, Platinum Week last year with our partners and to see it on again this year, even though it's been delayed from June to the current slot. And that's just ahead of the New York Platinum Week, which is, uh, which is next week. Uh, we're also focusing on the CO2 reduction um, imperatives uh, that Platinum unlocks. Uh, and we certainly are uh, developing a lot more research. We've already started on that. And I'll touch on it briefly. So just to set the scene, um, I think there's been a profound event this year. The uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine had a huge impact on the world, really. 
and certainly on global uh, metal markets. And what we can see on this chart uh, is that the industrial metals typically have suffered uh, quite greatly. Uh, obviously, the downturn in terms of the global economic outlook and certainly the impact of that invasion on energy prices. So we've seen uh, things like copper, nickel, and aluminium drop anywhere between uh, you know, 30 to 40 percent and certainly have taken a pounding. Uh, if you look at the blue line for platinum, platinum certainly has held up particularly well. It's held up almost as well as gold, which has been in strong demand uh, as a protection against inflation and almost a safe haven asset. If you look at the other line on that chart, the palladium line, that certainly has reacted far, great, far more uh, to the news flow from Russia. You can see that orange line peaking uh, just at the beginning, just after the invasion, and moving up and down on news flow. And that really is because Russia provides 40% of global palladium, but only about 10 or 11% of global platinum. So certainly concerns about global palladium supply has resulted uh, in that. So we've got uh, both strength in automotive, jewelry, and industrial for platinum, uh, security of supply concerns playing into the hydrogen economy, and significant ongoing elevated imports into China. So with that seen, what I'll move on to is our platinum quarterly. It is fairly data heavy for those of you that haven't seen it before. And what I'll do is I'll cover the data for the quarter, uh, quarter two ending June, and then I'll move into the full year 2022 forecast. So just looking at this uh, table and uh, I've highlighted some of the key data in those red boxes. And what that shows is the uh, supply of platinum, the refined production uh, out of the main producing countries, South Africa and Zimbabwe, over 70 percent, a little bit out of North America and some out of Russia, that 10 percent I mentioned. Uh, and then recycling supply uh, is certainly part of their contribution to this roughly 8 million ounce uh, a year market. So what we noticed at the top, refined mine supply was down about 20%, uh, largely as the uh, surpluses, that was the production of uh, some locked up material ended uh, last year. Uh, but we've also got recycling supply down quite heavily by about 86,000 ounces. So mining supply down, recycling supply down, and overall the total four to two is down about 7% year on year, about 145,000 ounces for the quarter. Just looking at that graphically, and we focus here on the South African uh, mine production, um, the bar with the red line around it shows that you're quarter two much stronger than quarter one, and that's the seasonal influence, certainly down on last year. And uh, There have been COVID disruptions and certainly labor shortages, and there are some severe power outages that are currently occurring in South Africa, but those really only started towards the tail end of quarter two and didn't really impact on quarter two, which was reasonably strong. Uh, more importantly, the supply of recycled platinum, mainly from uh, scrapped water catalysts, is significantly down, down 20% year on year, just over 80,000 ounces. And on the chart, you can see those columns. The blue section is the uh, water catalyst recycle. And what's happening here is that uh, because globally, automakers have been really struggling to produce enough new vehicles, to meet consumer demand. The shortage of uh, semiconductor chips and supply chain shortages mean that they've been unable to produce that. And that's meant that consumers need to drive their cars for longer. And as a result, the, uh, uh, far fewer vehicles are being scrapped uh, and therefore this recycle supply is down. So mining supply down, recycle supply down, that doesn't look to be changing anytime soon either. We then turn to uh, demand, and we look at the demand components on the left, the four major demand categories, automotive, jewellery, industrial, and investment. We've seen automotive, jewellery, and industrial higher, up over 80,000 ounces together. But investment, the way we categorise it, is down by over 300,000 ounces. And those are the three categories that I'll elaborate on uh, in, in a little more shortly. Uh, firstly, the bar and coin, uh, then ETF and exchange stocks, all down by different amounts and for certainly different reasons. But we're left with a quarterly surplus of just on 350,000 ounces. Uh, just quickly looking at those uh, various subcategories uh, in chart form, uh, we can see there that automotive uh, is particularly strong. Despite all the headwinds, significantly fewer vehicles being produced than pre-COVID, and even including the lower, 4% uh, lower production of light vehicles, 
and 31% uh, less production of heavy duty vehicles. And it was mainly a China effect where China fire trucks were bought quite aggressively ahead of the new China six emissions legislations. Uh, we've still got platinum automotive demand particularly resilient. And that's mainly because there's a higher uh, portion of heavy duty trucks that now use platinum uh, in their uh, emissions control and certainly a lot more platinum for palladium uh, substitution in light vehicles. Jewelry, pleasing to see up. Uh, obviously, China was heavily impacted by the zero COVID lockdowns, and that had two impacts. Firstly, uh, uh, jewelry couldn't be produced, and secondly, consumers couldn't get into stores to buy jewelry. A lot of that pent up demand played out when those lockdowns were lifted, and we've certainly had healthy gains in the US, Japan, and India. Industrial, this is quite a busy chart, and for those of you not familiar with this, this does tend to look a little volatile. Uh, obviously, in uh, quarter 220, we had the COVID effect. But in general, if you look at this very right-hand uh, uh, column, which represents quarter two this year, and you compare it to the very far left column, which is quarter two in 2018, you can see that that's been steady growth. And this demand segment is the most strongly correlated to global economic growth. And over the last 10 years, has probably grown at almost double uh, the rate of global growth. So a very important ongoing uh, demand growth segment. The reason you get so much change is that when you get capacity additions, there's a huge amount of metal that goes in, much bigger than the wear associated with those catalysts. So this year, obviously, uh, glass um, was very strong in 2021, yet the quarter had a slightly weaker period. Uh, chemical down 19% again on an exceptionally strong 2021. But in general, uh, this uh, group of demand segments, very diversified use, uh, is strongly uh, linked to economic growth uh, and fairly resilient in terms of its applications to things like uh, inflation. Then moving on to investment, I said I'd unpack these three categories uh, in the uh, columns. The green is bar and coin, orange is ETF, and gray is exchange stocks. And just focusing on those two, if we look at the quarter two last year and then quarter one, uh, sorry, quarter two this year, we can see that strong uh, surplus or, or positive demand going to negative demand. Just looking at bar and coin, uh, the 70,000 ounce green bar, that is particularly strong demand in historical terms. Uh, ETFs understandably down on recessionary fears uh, and certainly on commodity price, strong dollar, rising interest rates. But with ETFs, you've got the other side as well, is that a lot of people concerned about inflation will be looking to hard assets and actually increasing their holding. And that's a mix of both. Uh, the exchange stocks, that's metal held against uh, positions on the futures market. Uh, during COVID, that increased significantly. It has reduced. And we show that flow uh, because it helps us understand the visible versus less visible, non-visible investment demand. And that's been drawn down because of these significant uh, imports uh, into China. So moving from the quarter to the full year, that's the full year table. I won't dwell on it other than to say that refined production and recycling is down by 700,000 ounces uh, year on year, quite profound. Uh, automotive is strong, industrial is less than it was in the strong 2021. And the investment demand swing uh, of over 500,000 ounces materially is what's resulting in this surplus of nearly a million ounces uh, forecast for the full year. And if we just look at the um, waterfall charts uh, on this slide, you can see the top chart heavily dominated by the reduction in supply from South Africa and the reduction in recycle. And the bottom chart, you can see the strong automotive, the lower industrial, and certainly the impact uh, of that uh, reduced investment demand year on year. So interestingly, we've got a, a large surplus but a, a sort of a paradox in the market where the market is extremely tight and metal availability in the spot market is low. Uh, if we just look at this chart, it shows the platinum lease rate, and that is if somebody is unable to buy metal in the spot market, they can lease it. And this is the rate that they would pay to lease that metal. A lot of volatility in the early 2000s, but literally for the 10 years prior to COVID, that level sat at about 0.3.4%. So we saw a massive spike during COVID, understandably, as metal was almost uh, impossible to move around the world. But the interesting thing is that in May this year, the spike was even higher 
and that remains at elevated levels. And this suggests a shortage. So to have a surplus that we're publishing, uh, yet a shortage in the spot market is really unusual. What we try and uh, show is that if we have a look at that strength from automotive, industrial, and jewellery, that would leave, together with that 8% uh, reduction in supply, the market almost balanced. The flow out of ETFs and the exchange stocks takes us to this nearly million-ounce surplus. However, if we look at the imports into China over and above identified demand, annualizing that suggests that those imports will actually exceed that surplus. And that's why we've got a marketing surplus, uh, yet more than likely once we allocate uh, the imports into China, we'll have this market in deficit. So what I'll try and do now is go behind the data uh, and discuss some of the trends. And we've got this worsening economic environment. We've got this continued market tightness the potential elimination of that entire surplus, and then importantly, platinum's role in de decarbonization. So just looking at the macro effects, what we can see on this chart is that the GDP growth of the major economies is trending uh, towards or below zero. And usually when economic growth declines, we have central banks uh, pulling fiscal levers to try and uh, stimulate the economy by reducing interest rates. Uh, and usually that is uh, exactly the opposite is happening. If we just look at the um, CPI as a measure of inflation uh, in the different jurisdictions, we've had this massive increase in inflation levels not seen for decades. And as a result, those central banks are actually increasing interest rates to try and uh, put a lid on this inflation, uh, completely contrary to what you would normally expect uh, in a declining uh, economic outlook. Uh, these inflation rates are significant uh, to say the least. Uh, part of driving those inflation rates is certainly energy prices. And, and as a result of uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, we've had those energy prices race to uh, extreme levels and certainly funding uh, that uh, extreme inflation. Uh, the other unusual uh, feature is that despite uh, the poor economic outlook and the inflationary concerns, we've got an incredibly strong uh, labour market. Uh, that the actual unemployment rates are significantly down, particularly in low-skilled and unskilled uh, positions. So this uh, unusual uh, economic outlook is overlaying this platinum market, and that's where we sit uh, in terms of looking at our supply-demand balance. This is a, a Sankey chart, and what it does is for particularly new investors that are not familiar to platinum as an investment, it shows on the left the supply of metal into this market, and on the right the drivers of demand. As I mentioned, in South Africa, Zimbabwe, North America, and Russia uh, as the primary supply on the left and on the right, automotive, jewelry, industrial, and investment. And just some features, obviously, South Africa dominates the supply, whereas Russia is only 10%, and that's part of uh, the reduced concern regarding Russian metal, uh, but still important. And on the right, we can see at the top this recycle of metal, mainly from end-of-life auto catalysts, uh, and that has been certainly curtailed uh, by the auto industry's uh, uh, struggles. Um, on the bottom, we can see industrial demand, and there's a very big closed loop, as I mentioned. Uh, a lot of uh, a, a large amount of metal installed during capacity additions, uh, but a large recirculating loop of that. And then a feature of this at the bottom, you can see a lot of that negative platinum investment then returns to supply. I thought it would be interesting, given the importance of the link between platinum and palladium, particularly in its substitution in gasoline water catalysts, to briefly look at that palladium market. Now, the platinum market is a typically between 6 and 8 million ounce market. The palladium market a lot bigger, uh, just over 10 million ounces. What we can see here is that South Africa and Russia are almost similar in their supply to the market. And that's that 40% of supply that the world is really concerned about. At the moment, there really are no sanctions against nor nickel, the major producer, or the metal. And if you were to sanction palladium, essentially you'd have to stop making gasoline cars uh, in the US. Uh, on the right-hand side, you can see that the use of palladium is dominated by its use in automated catalysts, very small amount going to industrial. So that just positions those two markets. So turning back now to platinum, and apologies for this very busy slide, I'll try and make its busyness go away a little. I'd like you to look at the, at the columns in the background uh, behind the lines. And those columns represent uh, the imports of uh, platinum into China. 
And the lower half of the column, the blue, is the identified demand. That's the demand going into automotive, jewelry, industrial, and investment into China. And the uh, pink uh, or red colored uh, top part of that are the excess imports. Now, last year, in the last three quarters of last year, we saw nearly 1.2 million ounces of additional platinum go into China. And that was largely written off to speculative uh, purchases by people close to the supply chains in China. What we have noticed is the first uh, in the second quarter of this year, almost identical amounts of additional imports. And this leads us to believe that it's not all speculative. But just to unpack what's on the rest of this chart, the blue line uh, is obviously the platinum price. Uh, and I spoke a little bit about the lease rates. And on this chart, the lease rates are in red. So what we do notice is that during COVID, we had this big spike uh, of the lease rates. And more recently, that spike was certainly associated by this massive import of metal into China. The two other bits on this chart is that we've got this gray line, and those were the stocks held uh, in NYMEX exchanges. Now, that rose to nearly 700,000 ounces uh, last year, and that's been drawn down to nearly 200,000. And the way that happens is that this uh, gray shaded area are the exchange for physical or EFPs. And what that means is that where there's a shortage of metal in the spot market, typically in London or Zurich, uh, those EFP rates go negative to attract that metal out, and that certainly has been successful. So we think this is behind why the large imports into China are creating the shortage in the market. The difficulty really is that those imports, uh, particularly the pink uh, part of the column, do not yet reflect in our supply-demand balances. So just looking at that in a little more detail, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the flow of metal out of ETFs, there's been a significant reduction, part of that uh, a surplus that we're showing. And that certainly has been associated with a, a weaker uh, platinum price, even though it's held up well against other industrial metals. Uh, as those holdings of ETFs decline, we do know that the holders tend to have a longer term view, uh, their investment horizon and certainly higher price appreciation and understanding that platinum remains significantly undervalued. Uh, the chart at the bottom shows those NYMEX stocks that I mentioned, and they've come down almost to historic levels. So for 10 years prior to COVID, 200,000 ounces was roughly the level of the stocks in NYMEX futures. So we think there's not much more metal that can come out of either ETFs or futures, which suggests that that type of market should probably translate uh, into price. If we just look at the uh, impact of that 10 or 11% of platinum that comes out of China, uh, what we do know is that the self-sanctioning where people choose to want metal from other sources rather than Russia is certainly affect as those contracts uh, come to the end. But what we recognize on the bottom chart is that it's really not possible at the moment to fully substitute out of Russian palladium. And we do know that that metal is getting to the market. There would be about a 2 million ounce shortfall. So Russian palladium is certainly part of the market. Um, some of the uh, unusual routes of getting that metal to market through Turkey and Dubai and to Europe uh, continues, but certainly a worry uh, and a push for more substitution. Um, I mentioned earlier that the automakers were really struggling to make enough cars globally to meet consumer demand. And what I've tried to show on the slide is that we've got this full amount of demand for platinum uh, being at that 3 million level, higher than it was pre-COVID. Uh, what we do believe is that the semiconductor shortage uh, is causing a huge uh, reduction uh, and causing that inability of the automakers. That is improving. It's certainly still a big feature of 2021 and 2022. So looking forward, we do know that there is inflation. We do know that there are recessionary fears. There certainly is an increase in interest rates that people would pay to buy vehicles. But we believe, and we use the LMC forecast of this, is that that reduction in consumer demand is still going to be at a level lower than where the automakers can actually produce vehicles. Uh, and if we look at the bottom, we can see the amount of vehicles that have been almost undersupplied that, that uh, feed into this uh, um, pent-up demand. Um, Second-hand vehicle prices really show this quite strongly. They've been up 40% and in the US. Uh, they're almost up 100% at the moment. So certainly we think they've pent up demand. And what this means is, is that, yes, there is uh, inflation, but it certainly doesn't impact platinum in the way that a lot of people are assuming that it might impact. In other words, just poor economic outlook, less vehicles, less platinum. 
what we're saying is that the platinum automotive demand is likely to remain identical uh, despite uh, the fact that there will be inflation. Moving on just to look at another concern the market has, and that is whether or not uh, the banning of internal combustion engines and the reduction of internal combustion engines as battery electric vehicles and fuel cell electric vehicles penetrate mean that platinum demand is likely to drop off. Uh, what we show here is the global powertrain mix out to 2040, strong penetration of the yellow by electric vehicles, but certainly a massive internal combustion engine tail. And if we look at the platinum automotive demand that matches that uh, change, you can see that between now and even 2026, there is growth in demand for platinum from internal combustion engines. And as the fuel cell electric vehicles in heavy duty starts, that that transition leads to continued growth. And that was quite a surprise to a lot of people. Uh, the other uh, uh, um, interesting dynamic is the substitution of platinum or palladium uh, in uh, gasoline vehicles. And if you look at the top chart, you can see that the price of palladium has been at a significant premium to platinum for several years. And what we've noticed is that if we just assume substitution happens on the new models that are brought to market each year, about 20% of them, and that's, that substitution is either 30% or 50%, well below the level that we know can be done at least 70% without changing uh, any of the uh, catalytic performance, is that there's about a billion dollars uh, potential in that straight bottom line to the automakers. So we think this has been aggressively pursued and happening, but yet underreported because the, uh, it's obviously proprietary and confidential information still isn't available. So trying to put all that together, and thank you for staying with me for such a data-heavy and complex presentation, is I'm just trying to show on this chart that we've got this massive surplus, we've got concerns about supply chain shortages and about slowing economic growth, but we've got a situation where either low or high substitution will almost erode that entire surplus. Uh, we've also got a situation where the loadings of heavy-duty vehicles in China appear to be unnaturally below those of the heavy-duty trucks in Europe and the US. Uh, the current loadings um, calculated by the amount of platinum and the number of heavy-duty vehicles produced in China suggests around five grams of platinum per vehicle, where we know that in Europe and the US it's closer to 17 to 20 grams, and that explains a lot of it. So these excess China imports are similar to 2020, 2021, or the first half of 2022, uh, any um, combination of these effects uh, could take this market from this massive surplus uh, into a deficit, and that could already be the case. Um, we've also done uh, our own WPRC research, and just to be clear, our one-year forward outlooks are uh, produced for us by Metals Focus as an independent third party, uh, and we use those in the uh, platform 40 data that I presented earlier, We've done our own research and we're publishing from years two to five uh, what our research shows, given the scenarios that I've discussed. And we see that there are progressively deepening deficits in platinum, which also seems to be uh, not as well appreciated by the market as we would like. We certainly continue to communicate that as best we can. Um, just an important thing before I end, uh, and that is platinum's key role in uh, decarbonisation. I think three or four years ago, the decarbonisation um, benefits of hydrogen were perhaps uh, ignored. Uh, I think over the last two years, they've certainly have come to the fore. And there's real, really two reasons. One is uh, energy supply concerns, uh, and the other is the actual benefit in terms of producing that green hydrogen and using it in fuel cell vehicles. So what we're trying to show here is that the savings by uh, green hydrogen um, and replacing natural gas, and that is the drive in Europe, or green hydrogen effectively replacing gasoline or diesel in internal combustion engines, give a significant range of savings. And if we look at the uh, targets uh, for the targeted CO2 reductions to either limit global warming to 1.5% or 2%, uh, platinum facilitates a contribution of up to 11% of those global targets by 2013. And if we look at the chart on the uh, bottom, we can see that the combination of platinum used in electrolyzers to produce green hydrogen, as well as platinum used in fuel cell vehicles, grows to almost 30% or the largest uh, component uh, of platinum demand by 2040. 
And then one last one, we know that there's been significant support uh, from governments around the world uh, for decarbonisation. Uh, certainly the EU's drive to replace Russian uh, natural gas with green hydrogen, they're replacing 20 billion cubic metres, uh, and that is producing a significant amount and will use up to 250,000 ounces of platinum per annum by 2030. Not a massive amount uh, in itself, but certainly something else that builds on this really tight market. And then on the bottom chart, if we just look at the uh, benefits uh, in terms of the amount of platinum uh, that will be uh, used to support decarbonisation. You can see that the bottom uh, dark red line is what had been in place for uh, North America, significantly lower than the other regions, China, uh, Europe, and the rest of the world. Uh, the passing of the US's Inflation Reduction Act recently, or what's more commonly known as the Climate Act, uh, certainly changes that game significantly. So uh, the reduction uh, in the cost of uh, producing green hydrogen certainly will see North America become a very large uh, participant. So to sum up, and again, thank you for uh, staying at the distance. Um, what we have seen is that uh, we've got robust automotive, jewelry and industrial demand for platinum, despite the slowing economic outlook. Uh, we think self-sanctioning could exclude some of that Russian material from the global market and certainly tighten in a really tight, tight market. Uh, thirdly, that continued physical tightness on those imports into China that could absorb the entire surplus. And then this recognition and the longer term and, and near term growth of Platinum's uh, support for global decarbonisation. So I thank you for your time uh, and I'll hand you back to Ed. Thank you.